Okay, so as it appears, we don't have any more people waiting in the waiting room. We will make a, a start. So I would like to welcome you to this webinar run by HIDAX and the Energy Research Accelerator as part of the Carbonizing Transport Week. In this webinar, experts from academia and industry will be present, uh, will be discussing the role hydrogen will play in the future of decarbonisation of aerospace, rail and road transport. I'm Kat Mycock, HIDEX's Research Development and Impact Manager, and I will be chairing this session. Before we begin, there is a few bits of housekeeping I'd just like to cover. Firstly, this webinar will be recorded. Um, if you could please make sure that your mic is muted and remains muted. And finally, um, we'll be using the chat box for questions, which we will come to at the end of the presentations. Also, if tweeting about the talks, we'll be using the hashtag Decarbonisation Week and Hydex Midlands. Um, so before we begin with our presentations, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about Hydex uh, and why we are hosting this webinar. Um, Hydex is a three-year hydrogen development and knowledge exchange program funded by Research England. We are currently in year two. The program brings together Midlands universities, businesses, policymakers, with the aim of accelerating the hydrogen economy in the Midlands. The program allows businesses and other organisations to access university facilities and draw upon expertise for advice and guidance about uh, hydrogen for a range of applications, including for transport. It also supports product development, training, connecting with and informing policymakers, as well as connecting with others doing hydrogen work and our international partners. Our hydrogen demonstrators are based at our partner universities. They provide a platform for showing a range of ways of hydrogen production, including from wind, solar, biomass and biochar. And Dr. Uh, Peter Clough will be talking more about uh, the, some methods of green hydrogen production. Other demonstrators offer opportunities to support development of hydrogen technology, for example, modelling, testing and validation of technologies. Um, and uh, the University of Nottingham has a, a demonstrator that is a diesel engine that has been retrofitted to flex between hydrogen and ammonia. And one of our speakers, Professor Stuart Hillsmanson, will be speaking about his work on hydrogen trains at the University of Birmingham. Now, if you wish to Kat, uh, connect... Sorry, Kat, could you just make your screen bigger? Because um, I've just had a comment saying they can't see the slide. Uh, Are you on full screen? Yeah. Yeah, it's on full screen as far as I'm aware. Oh. OK. Sorry, I'm, I'm yeah. So this is um, so this is my final um, slide anyway. So um, today, if you kind of wish to connect uh, with Hydex and to fi find out about more about how we can support your organisation, then please get in touch with me. So I'm Kat. Uh, my email is uh, katherine.mycock at hydex.ac.uk. Um, and um, I'm going to kind of stop sharing there. And I would uh, like to welcome our first speaker, who is Dr. Peter Clough, a senior uh, lecturer in engineering, um, at energy engineering at Cranfield. Uh, Peter is leading the Cranfield Hyper Project, produce it, and, and we'll be discussing green hydrogen production um, and Cranfield's work on developing a hydrogen uh, powered plane. So Peter, if you could um, load up your and share your screen with us, yeah. and I'll hand over to you. Of course, thank you very much. Um, so you should be able to see my screen at the moment. Um, can you see my screen? Just so I check. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah thank you. Can. you. Yeah, cool. that's great. Okay, thank you. So um, yeah, this talk is mostly about hydrogen in aviation and aerospace. Um, I have got a little bit on hydrogen production at the end, but mostly around hydrogen uh, in aviation. Now. Uh, as my title suggests there, I am not the expert in aviation. I am not the expert in aerospace. However, the person beneath my name, Bobby Zethi, he is. So if you are really interested in hydrogen for aviation and hydrogen for aerospace, then please drop Bobby a line. Um, his email address is there. Alternatively, you can use the QR code, um, which will give you a straight link to his, um, his team's uh, website, which tells you all about the work that they're doing. So what I'm giving you here is an overview of the research that the 
the university is doing in hydrogen for aviation, not just Bobby's research group. Um, but hopefully it'll be quite interesting. So let's begin. So um, I want to start off with a, a bit of background. The UK has set a national strategy for hydrogen. Uh, and it said that we're going to have 10 gigawatt of hydrogen production by 2030, and they want at least half of it to be green. Whether that is realistic or not is, is debatable, but 10 gigawatt is a big number. Um, at the moment, we produce about three gigawatt of grey hydrogen in the UK. So what we're suggesting is we're going to completely shut down every single hydrogen production plant in the UK and rebuild them three times over by 2030. So we've got a huge amount of work to do and that job doesn't stop at 2030. It continues well on to 2050, where it just continues to expand and expand. So we've got a huge amount of work to do in aviation and in aerospace, because that's going to be one of the biggest areas that hydrogen is going to be used. Some of the other areas that we expect hydrogen to be heavily used is going to be the big transport vehicles, the HDP vehicles, um, maritime, so whether that's onboard ships or the port docking material port docking vehicles. And then there's going to be things like industry, um, areas that are hard to decarbonize, so steel, cement, um, they're going to be very difficult to decarbonize without having hydrogen. And there's also going to be low, um, aspects of hydrogen that could be used in peak load power supply or balancing the grid. Um, and I'm sure there's others on there that I haven't included. So we've got a lot of jobs to do. We've got a lot of work to do. And the government has set a 10 point plan of how we're going to recover from COVID and have a green industrial revolution. And number two on that list is hydrogen. <coughs> um, so at Cranfield University, we have this nice pretty picture which shows you an overview of all the work we're doing. It's called our hydrogen walk. And really the work we're covering at Cranfield is covering everything from production through to transportation, storage, supply chains, um, distribution of hydrogen, and then all of the end users of hydrogen as well. And we're also looking at hydrogen safety as well in every single area of that. Um, some of the blue boxes on there are all about the production of hydrogen and whether we're producing it from blue sources, green sources, or whatever color you want to call it. Really, we should be talking about just low carbon hydrogen rather than the color of hydrogen. Um, and then we've also got work going on in ammonia. We've got looking at people looking at contrails and um, the, the use of hydrogen in aviation and aerospace. And we've got people looking at stationary applications of hydrogen in gas turbines. So we do a huge amount of work on, on hydrogen at Cranfield and um, there's lots that we could talk about, but today we're only gonna focus on the aviation side. <coughs> Now, Cranfield has been working on this area for since, since well into uh, the year 2000, if not before then. And back then, we were always seen as the crazy people because nobody considered hydrogen in aviation as being a realistic thing. But in time, that viewpoint has changed. And now you have companies like Airbus that are committing to having a zero emission aircraft, the zero E, which is going to be a hydrogen fueled aircraft. So the, the entire industry and academia has changed its viewpoint and Cranford has been leading that. Now, hydrogen in aircraft doesn't make sense in every single case. There are plenty of cases where you could electrify aircraft and that works really, really well, especially for the smaller vehicles, uh, the smaller aircraft. And that's where you're traveling short distances. And if you kind of put it in perspective, 1000 nautical miles is roughly from London to Milan or uh, Rome, somewhere about there. So it's it's somewhere in Italy. And you kind of, if you imagine drawing a circle around um, that kind of distance, that's how far an electric plane will get you. Beyond that, you need to start thinking of a different fuel. And that could be a SAF, it could be a sustainable aviation fuel. But as you can see by the um, timeline graph in the middle there, the current best estimates is that SAF will be a part of the solution in the future, but it's not going to be a long-term solution. It's going to be something that gets us from where we are now to a pure hydrogen or pure battery system. Um, the other option is to go pure hydrogen, is whether that's a compressed gas or compressed liquid. Um, but the, the green hydrogen solution for uh, aviation is likely to be how you achieve having an aircraft that can go from London to Abu Dhabi or London to Australia. And um, the benefits of doing all of this is that you have a zero emission aircraft, you don't get emissions at the back end, apart from you need to control your NOx and control your con contrails and your noise, but that can be done through technology. Um, 
and you get higher efficiency of operation, um, higher efficiency of aircraft. And um, what we really don't want to do, uh, it seems a crazy idea in some ways, is, is to stop people flying. Flying is one of the best ways to create economic growth. So we don't want to stop people flying, um, but we do want to stop people flying on bad technology. So existing technology using kerosene is a bad technology because it emits CO2. It's a, a large emitter of CO2. So if you can fly on hydrogen, then you can keep the economy growing. And there's a lot of talent and skills that need to be developed in order to make that happen. So um, hydrogen versus sustainable aviation fuels. Um, if we look at the amount of emissions that you have from each fuel source, kerosene has, or all of the aircraft have this dark blue section. So you have to produce the fuel. You have to produce the, the aircraft that can use that fuel. So that's a bit of emissions that you can't get away from. Then you've got the combustion of each of those fuels. For kerosene and sustainable aviation fuels, you do have emissions that are generated. Now with SAF, you always offset that emissions because you're assuming it's coming from a biogenic source. But with hydrogen, um, you don't have those emissions that doesn't exist. And if you actually generate your hydrogen from a um, green source in the future, so from a biomass source, then you actually end up with a negative form of flight compared to other fuel types. So whereas kerosene and SAF are always going to be slightly positive, there is a, a potential that hydrogen could actually be a negative um, combustion solution, a negative emission solution. At Cranfield, we've got a few companies that are developing these kind of technologies to make this happen. Uh, one of them was Zero Avia. They were based at Cranfield up until um, a year or two ago. Uh, they crashed their, their one aircraft and um, they ended up moving to a, a slightly bigger site uh, down in Birmingham, I believe they're based now. Um, but they, we still work very heavily with Zero Avia and we're still very supportive of the work they're doing. We also have a site, a uh, company on site called Cranfield Aerospace Solutions, and they are again de de developing a hydrogen fired aircraft, which is a slightly different design, but we're still very, very actively engaged with that company. Um, and there are others on site, like um, a company called Lavidian, who are generating special carbon fibers, carbon materials, and they can be used for the storage vessels for these hydrogen vehicles. So we've got a lot of um, industry experience in, in aviation. And because we're one of the only universities from the airport, we have a slight, <laughs> slight advantage. Um, but we've got the experience of doing this. So we've, we've looked at many different ways in which you're going to make this happen and how liquid hydrogen fueled aircraft are going to be developing over the future. So one of the first things is going to have to be certification, and then it's going to be about improving efficiency, and then it's going to be about generating new types of aircraft that can improve the flight, flight times. And one of the projects we um, had at Cranfield, or we, we led at Cranfield, was called Enable H2. And this was all about um, developing a liquid hydrogen fueled aircraft and all of the technology you need to make that happen. So at Cranfield, we were particularly focused on the combustion of hydrogen to regenerate, but the low NOx, uh, ultra low NOx form of combustion. Um, we were also involved with the fuel system management and in particular the heat management because liquid hydrogen is obviously very cold, but the combustion is very hot. So you've got to do some kind of transfer of heat to get from where it is stored to where it needs to be used. And we're also looking at technology evaluations and the different routes for scale up. Um, we had a huge industrial collaboration with this. Um, there are lots and lots of big names on there, but they're also covering everything from the, the designers, the OEMs of the gas turbines and the aircraft, and the people who make the hydrogen and the people who certify all of this and the, the, air, the um, airports as well. So it was a very, very big project. And um, if we're looking at just the, some of the aspects of the project we were looked at, um, this is the micromix combustion technology that was developed at Cranfield. And lots and lots of fancy equipment essentially, but you have a um, air channel that comes in this way, you have a hydrogen channel that comes in this way, and a combustion happens here. And there are lots of sensors to make sure you can measure everything and to see the NOx emissions, etc. Um, but that combustion chamber that's shown here is one small part of the entire system. Um, this is called a pebble bed reactor. Um, and again, it's something that's developed at Crownfield and is one of the largest systems in the entire country for doing these kind of tests. Um, here it is a, in a 
a slightly more pretty picture. Um, and with this kind of equipment, we can look at the actual flame stability, we can look at the flame colour, and we can do modelling as well of all of these different types of flames and look at blends of these different fuels. So Enable HD was critical for enabling this liquid hydrogen research to, to occur. And um, from that, we then developed a whole set of new research avenues that need to be explored. Um, so we were looking at um, where does the hydrogen actually get produced? And if you're going to use that hydrogen at an airport, then where is best to produce that hydrogen? Should you produce it on site? Should you produce it close by? Should you just move it to site? Um, there's a whole load of work that needs to still be done. And following on from uh, the Enable H2 project, we had a project called Zest, which is led by Airbus and funded by ATI. And Cranford was looking at the things like the technology development for the the fuel tanks itself. If you imagine liquid hydrogen is a liquid and it's going to be flying, there is going to be this sloshing effect, which is what you can see down the bottom right there. And that has not been explored before properly. So we've got a huge amount of work to do in looking at how liquid hydrogen behaves inside a, a moving vehicle, a moving tank. Um, Cranfield is also the lead partner for the hydrogen group on the UK ARC, um, which is the UK Aerospace Research Consortium, which is a mixture of all the different universities looking at aviation, and we are leading the hydrogen area. And it's been split into three different streams, hydrogen in the vehicle, in the aircraft, hydrogen in the airport, and green hydrogen to the airport. Um, so these are supposed to cover all of the different aspects of how you enable hydrogen to be used in the aircraft. So hydrogen in the aircraft is all focused on obviously hydrogen in the aircraft, so the storage, the combustion, the tanks, um, the safety around it, and certification. And then hydrogen in the airport is about uh, safety of the movement of hydrogen, how you enable people to refuel aircraft safely, but also looking at the, the ground operations. How many people do you need to, st to staff this system? How different is it to compare to the existing systems? And hydrogen to the airport is all about how you produce it. Um, and where, where, what sources of hydrogen do you use? What, what sources of material do you use to get it? Um, so that all of that kind of work, the UK ARC, is all about generating the latest research that needs to be done. And um, we've had several workshops that have been held about this, who may have even been involved in some of these workshops. Um, but the, the outcome from this is going to be future research projects. We've also started some work on ammonia as an aviation fuel. Um, so we have rigs that are set up to combust ammonia, and we can also do modeling on different types of combustors for ammonia. And the reason why this is important is that we may see ammonia used over liquid hydrogen because um, it is a higher density and is an easier fuel to handle. But you've obviously got more nitrogen in there, so there's potential for more NOx. So we also model, model the NOx in great detail and look at the combustion of this. So one of the projects we've got at the moment is called Napkin. Um, this project is all about um, the safety of hydrogen. Um, or it's actually a bigger project, but one part that Cranford is heavily involved in is safety. And it's led by a colleague called Thomas Budd. And one of the things that we can do at Cranford that we can't do in many other places is we can simulate hydrogen fires in hydrogen aircraft. So we can we have our own fire department on site um, because of the aviation work we do anyway. And um, we then have the project fresh on aircraft, the hydrogen aircraft, and we can then utilize it and simulate how a fire crew should respond to a hydrogen fire. Um, they can also respond to hydrogen leaks, they can use their different measurement techniques, and we can utilize that to then train new fire crews up in dealing with these kind of risks. Um, this is one of the projects called Hyper, and this is all about hydrogen production. So at Cranfield, we um, we do several projects on hydrogen production. This is one of the biggest ones, and it's actually my ones, so that's why I like to talk about it. But Hyper is a project where we're producing low carbon hydrogen from steam and a hydrocarbon fuel source. So in this case, we're showing to use natural gas, but there's no reason why we couldn't use biogas or syngas. The idea of this is that we take the natural gas and steam, we heat it up, we pass it over our magic bean column, and these magic beans convert the, the gas into hydrogen and CO2, and we end up capturing the CO2 with a lime-based material. That lime-based material is then a solid CO2, so you end up with a pure stream of hydrogen coming out the top, 
and the solid CO2 is passed around the system and regenerated in the capsaicin, and you have a pure stream of CO2 coming out the top end. So you have two separate streams that come out, um, one of hydrogen, one of CO2, and um, that one step, once through process is incredibly efficient. It's, um, it ends up making a much lower cost of hydrogen compared to all other hydrogen production method technologies. Um, so this is being built on Cranfield site. It's a one megawatt pilot plant facility, and it produces up to 700 kilos of hydrogen per day. Um, I've highlighted a few things that uh, or the, the main parts of the plant on site. So we have the, the big white scary cylinder on the right hand side here that everybody thinks is liquid hydrogen. In reality, it's just liquid nitrogen that we use for heating up, cooling down and purging. Um, we then have several shipping containers on site, which are for electrical things, instrument air, gas analyzers. Um, and then we have the main structure. And on the main structure, you've got the, the sorbent hearts reforming reactor, which is hidden down the middle there. And then we have uh, all the other process plant and equipment, steam generation, venting, and we have a, a plane in the background there. Um, that plane, I think, was lent to us from British Airways at the end of service, and we now use it for teaching purposes. Um, <coughs> so um, I said earlier that we're not limited to using natural gas. We can actually use biogas and syngas, and that's one of the projects we followed on from Hyper, where we did BioHyper. Um, this project was funded by UK government in a phase one of the hydrogen BEX competition. And from this, we were able to generate what would be the expected levelized cost of hydrogen when you were to scale this project up and what would be the net CO2 benefit of doing so. So by doing a bio hyper, you end up with actually producing hydrogen with a net negative emission of CO2, which is fantastic. And that means that you can then utilize that form of hydrogen to offset other emissions. Um, most recently, we have won an award. Um, this award was part of the Hydrogen Award. It was the Academic, Elex Academic Excellence in Hydrogen Research and Innovation. Uh, so we're very, very pleased to win that award. And that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, Peter. Questions. That was fantastic. Such a broad range of activity happening at Cranfield and it's generated a few questions. So we will come back to those questions um, okay. after other presentations. So thank you for, for such a fa fascinating and informative talk. And um, our next speaker is Catherine um, Chamberlain. So I'd like to welcome Catherine. Catherine is a senior manager um, in uh, product development at Toyota and is currently leading the Hilux fuel cell conversion project for to Toyota. So I'd like to welcome you, Catherine. And um, thank you very much for joining us today. Thanks very much and thank you to everyone who's listening in. So today I'm going to give you an overview of the project I'm working on, but I'm initially going to put it into context in terms of the Toyota wider strategy around hydrogen. Um, next slide, please. So at to Toyota, we're committed to achieving a carbon neutral society and we believe there is more than one solution for that. So as you can see on the slide, um, within our vehicle lineup, we've got BEV vehicle, uh, plug-in hybrid, hybrid, and um, obviously we've got the Mirai fuel cell vehicle and now working on the Hilux fuel cell vehicle. So we believe there's more than one solution, um, but fuel cell vehicles have a competitive advantage in terms of the longer range and also the fast refueling. Next slide, please. So we want to be there on all fronts uh, with all kinds of technologies and we think hydrogen's a key differentiator. Uh, and from Toyota, we've got a unique starting position um, and our goal is basically to, to have hydrogen leadership um, within uh, the automotive industry. Next slide, please. So to lead that um, hydrogen society, we believe that um, we want Toyota to be linked to hydrogen, just like it has been with hybrid over recent years. And we see there's two sort of key pillars um, to developing that uh, leadership. Firstly, we need to grow the hydrogen fuel cell systems on the market. So that's not just the vehicle lineups, hence uh, the new Hilux project, but also business to business applications of those fuel cells. 
And then second pillar is to grow the ecosystems, which will then support um, the current situation we've got where we need an uh, ecosystem to support the vehicle um, lineup and the business to business route. Next slide, please. So in terms of in infrastructure, this is obviously the chicken and egg situation that many uh, of you are aware of. The refuelling stations in the UK are currently reducing and we see in Europe there's a uh, the real lot faster development in many countries, uh, particularly, for example, in Germany. We're doing everything we can, but we need real momentum, particularly from the UK, to really grow that infrastructure. Uh, to help the, the Hydrogen Society for Automotive to, to grow more quickly. Next slide, please. And in terms of those eco clusters, you can see them on, on the map there. There's some currently developing and we're working and collaborating with um, other companies to try and grow those eco structures. Um, and they're predominantly developing around renewable energy locations, but also you can see within the Midlands, we're trying to, to progress that around our, our plant as well. So that gives you sort of an introduction in terms of the wider Toyota strategy. I'll now move on to um, the project. Sorry, these slides were supposed to be taken out. If you could just skip on, please. And the next one, that's it. Thank you. Um, so I'll now share the Hilux um, fuel cell project. And I'll, and I'll give you an overview of what it's about and what our vision is. Um, so next slide, please. So first of all, for this project, we were successful in applying for UK government funding um, through the APC, Advanced Proportion Centre, and that's really helped us break through um, and get this project off the ground. So it's sped up um, the activity and the schedule because we're collaborating with other engineering partners in the UK uh, to help the design and development of the Hilux. Um, and that's helped to speed it up and really progress more quickly than we would if we were going through our normal standard vehicle development cycle. Next slide, please. So what is the Hilux fuel cell conversion? So we're going to be bringing the Hilux base model in that's produced um, overseas. And then from the Mirai fuel cell vehicle, we'll be uh, procuring the fuel cell components, the stack, the tanks, and all the balance of plant parts. And then within Team UK here in Derbyshire, we're going to be converting that Hilux using those new fuel cell components, as well as newly designed parts within our supply chain. And we'll fast track that development through with our partner, Ricardo, who is helping us with the design work this year. Next slide, please. So this slide just gives you um, a bit more detail on the complexity of the design. Um, so you can see there at the top, we're, we're procuring that fuel cell powertrain, as I mentioned uh, before. And then we're procuring uh, the, the chassis frame, the body, and the key components that are carrying over from the existing Hilux. And then at the bottom there, you can see we've got many newly designed parts to help convert the vehicle into a fuel cell vehicle. And this has given us a huge amount of challenge. You can imagine just trying to get from a mechanical design point of view, everything into the Hilux um, shape and, and body that that's given us some challenges because uh, for example in the engine bay area there's a lot more space in the Toyota Mirai for the fuel cell stack so that's given us some headaches but we've got there now um, from a supply chain obviously we're trying to develop our supply chain for the newly designed parts um, so we've needed to do that quite quickly and also from a customer base um, we're aiming to meet the expectation of those customers and provide them with a product that delivers the, perform the performance excuse me, that they're used to from the current Hilux. So that's what we're aiming for. So next slide, please. So why are we trying to do this in Team UK? So Hilux is obviously a huge, iconic vehicle. Um, we want to build on that brand strength and also the Toyota fuel cell history. It's the largest pickup market in the EU, so there was a big um, benefit to do that in the UK. And we knew we had the, the uh, early adopters within the UK, the government funding, and then Toyota UK plant had the experience and capacity to, to work on this breakthrough project. So next slide, please. 
So for us in Team UK, this gives us a huge opportunity to really uh, develop within fuel cell vehicles. So it's the first fuel cell vehicle, obviously, we've had here in Team UK. First time we're working with hydrogen, first time we're doing a major conversion um, and having a, a refueling station on site. So loads of, of opportunity for development, upskilling and moving ourselves forward in this, uh, in this segment. Next slide, please. So you see on this slide, this is just um, our business revenue centre where we're cu currently cleared out an area to start building our prototype vehicles uh, in the coming months. So that's all currently under set up. And this year we'll build 10 prototype vehicles to really confirm that um, we can meet the performance of the Hilux and also start to have vehicles ready for demonstrating uh, demonstration activity. Next slide, please. So within Team UK, to get ready for those prototype builds, we're studying the vehicle, uh, the Hilux um, and the Mirai, obviously both new vehicles. We build the Corolla in Team UK. Um, so a lot of learning to get familiar um, with both the vehicles, but also the safety aspects of working with fuel cell and working with hydrogen um, and the new requirements it gives us in terms of our production process. Um, so lots of um, learning going on at the moment while we get ready for those, those trials. Next slide, please. And this is just our sort of top level schedule of our activity this year. So obviously we're in March now, we've come through the design activity and we're into the procurement of parts. We're starting to build vehicles in June and July, and then we'll do full evaluation of those, um, those vehicles towards um, an approval of the vehicle towards small series at the end of the year. Next slide, please. And who are we looking at from a customer point of view? So we recognise that this vehicle um, isn't necessarily for, for the general public. We want to focus on more fleet customers that are aiming to um, work towards carbon neutrality in the coming years. So we're looking at construction industries, local authorities, mining industries, that type of customer base. And we want to provide them a one-stop offer. So not just the vehicle, but the servicing. Uh, the finance um, and potentially the refueling as well. So we can really help them move towards those uh, carbon neutral targets that they're working on. Next slide, please. We've already done a lot of customer go and see both in the UK and in Germany, just to really understand what do the customers want? What do they need? And what are their strategies towards zero emission vehicles? That's helping us build our future strategy and um, towards how to use this vehicle um, both within the demonstration activity later this year and into next year, but also once we're into small series um, production that, you know, which customers um, really want this solution that we're offering. Next slide, please. And obviously this has given TM UK a huge amount of benefit and also our partners we're working with, but from a, a wider UK point of view, it's given the supplier base new opportunities, academia, new opportunities and, and creating jobs and skill in R&D. Um, so a huge amount of skill and knowledge transfer happening through this project. Next slide, please. So many of you may have seen the announcement of this project um, early December. So there's a huge amount of interest um, during uh, the latter part of this year and the early part of this year. Um, so we're building on that now towards a static vehicle reveal in quarter three um, after we've built those prototype vehicles and then we'll be doing a dynamic reveal at the early part of next year and then moving into real world testing with some key customers. So in summary, this project represents an, a huge opportunity for growth in UK and Europe within the fuel cell vehicles. When we aim to generate clusters, increase demand for hydrogen, using this as a platform and supporting our customers on their journey towards zero emission vehicles. So thank you very much for listening. And thank you, Catherine. That was an excellent presentation. Really clear. I really found your kind of design process and hearing about your ambitions for hydrogen Fantastic. So thank you very much for your time. And we'll come back to Catherine later on for uh, questions. So our final speaker today will be uh, Professor Stuart 
Helsmanson from the University of Birmingham. He is a professor of rail traction systems. Um, and in his work, he has been developing the first hydrogen fueled locomotive in the UK. Um, and he's heavily involved in the uh, industry's efforts to decarbonize. So welcome, Stuart. Uh, thank, thank, thank you very much. Um, and I'm just gonna share my screen and hopefully, hopefully you can all see that. It should be um, in uh, full screen format there. Um, so uh, thank you everyone for, for taking time out over your lunch uh, to, to join us today to talk about hydrogen and the role of decarbonisation of the transport system. Um, so I'm going to use uh, these sort of 20 minutes um, to talk, talk about uh, the application of hydrogen um, in, in rail systems. Um, and the picture that you can see uh, there was taken in, I think it was 2020, September 2020, um, and I, I was actually sitting on that train running running the fuel cell at the time. Uh, so that's a, a train that was converted into uh, uh, it was an existing train that had been been used uh, for some time for for 30 years or so, and then um, we converted it into running on a hydrogen and battery um, battery system. And we went through all the process of getting it approved to run on uh, the national railway network. So network rail approved um, the train to be to, to, to operate on the line. Uh, so I'm going to just tell you the story about how we think hydrogen has got a role in in, in railways um, in, in the UK and, and further afield as well and um, where it can be used and also where it can't be used. Um, we, we've been um, thinking about this for, for some time. We realised, I think I did my first paper on this um, back in, um, you know, early 2000s. So pretty much 20 years ago, we started thinking um, that there would be a problem with um, uh, diesel running out. Um, I mean, I mean, people had thought about this before. There, so I have actually found a paper from 1975 that, that looks at um, the, the problem of running autonomous rail vehicles in the future when diesel eventually becomes uh, uh, unsustainable and unacceptable to use. Um, so we realised hydrogen back then was a, a good candidate in terms of uh, providing um, propulsion power for a vehicle like uh, uh, a, a railway. Um, you probably all know this hydrogen is an energy vector. Um, so we, you know, we don't, don't have a naturally occurring source of hydrogen. Although I did learn recently, um, if, if, if any of you in the audience have got lactose intolerance, um, you might actually be uh, burping out hydrogen gas. So there is like tiny amounts of hydrogen and produced. Um, so yeah, if you can't produce, if you can't digest lactose, um, there, there's, there's some biological process that will produce hydrogen and your doctor can measure it with a hydrogen test. Um, however, it's not, not, not enough to, to do anything meaningful um, naturally, so we need to produce it. And, and the big criticism of hydrogen is you need to use a lot more um, energy uh, in, in its production than uh, it's released when it's used. Um, so, so the common argument or discussion in railway systems is, is shouldn't we just electrify the whole railway system? And, and you know, the, the, answer, the answer to that is yes, um, we should, but unfortunately we can't because it costs a huge amount of money. So it's just not, it's just not, not economic to do it. Um, and, and we can't do it rapidly enough either. So even if we wanted to do it, 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 it would take too long. Um, uh, it, it, as the grid decarbonise, decarbonizes anyway you know electric trains will benefit from that but so will hydrogen trains so as hydrogen becomes uh, carbon free uh, it doesn't really matter too much if if the energy efficiency isn't what we, we want it to be because it becomes an economic issue and provided the cost of hydrogen is is acceptable um, the the cost of the fuel to run a rail vehicle won't be prohibitive and you can still um, get enough people on the train uh, and it will cover it will cover the cost of running the service and easily cover the cost of the fuel so it's not going to be a, a problem in terms of not being economically viable um, I mean we all get this question and anyone working in hydrogen research say isn't it dangerous and and generally you say no because people have been using large quantities of hydrogen for for you know pretty much you know, probably probably about 100 years now at least at least 70 years has been produced uh, in bulk in the UK used as a process gas for all sorts of things um, and they're very very well established um, uh, processes and techniques for handling hydrogen, high pressure hydrogen safely. Um, and, and, and in generally, the public public doesn't know that it's already been used at, at large scale in, in as a process gas. Um, 
this in the rail industry isn't one type of rail industry that you know there's different different types of transport um so here's some two two pictures of two different types of train so on the right is a japanese shinkansen and obviously that sort of train is going to be electrified um there's huge um power requirements for a train like that you know something it's it, more than 10 megawatts probably something like um 10 15 maybe even 18 megawatts per per train um and those trains run on really really dense routes um uh, high high density lots of people lots of trains per hour and those those services are are definitely um candidates for electrification you you wouldn't suggest to run a hydrogen train on in a service like that the train on the left is is what we're we're looking at so a you know a two or three car unit um that that might be running at a more modest speed and not not such great distances um there's lots of these in this country and there's lots of trains like this uh, around the world i mean mo most of the railways around the world aren't electrified um so we we're looking at um uh, uh, providing traction technology that will work for those for those routes oh sorry went the wrong way um I, I came up with this graph to sort of illustrate that point a bit a bit more so on the on the x-axis we've got um like the intensity of the rail service and on the y-axis is kind of like whole a, a representation of the whole system cost so on on the right hand side of intensity of service you know high intensity of service there's there's a, a you know kind of battle between diesel and electrification and generally electrification will come out at the lowest system cost um but then there's some there's some point where diesel might be you know cost comparative uh, a comparable cost to electrification and 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 that might happen and then and then down on the left at the low lower intensity of service this is where we've got a bit of competition between lots of different technologies so we've got you know currently we're running diesel in in that sort of uh, scenario and that's that's the, the lowest cost if we move to something like battery a battery train um that can work um but the the range of a battery train is is going to be limited and remember we want we want battery we want trains to be operational for potentially 18 18 hours per day so um a battery train will need to have some sort of rapid charging uh, built into the schedule um and that that could limit its um, usefulness uh, and then a hydrogen train is likely to be a bit more expensive than a a battery train but 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 will have um uh, a better perform performance in terms of um, top speed and range and so on um, and then for those in low intensity services uh, although electrification could deliver decarbonisation it will end up costing uh, far more um, so you know ele typically electrifying one single track of kilometre uh, is, is somewhere in the order of um, two, two million pounds or, or slightly more depending on how complicated the railway is so so electrifying railways is a very expensive job it does make sense on busy routes but on on not busy routes we we we're not we don't get the economic case for it and you wouldn't be able to recover the cost of electrification just from the fares for example um this is yeah this is a paper i mentioned oh, it was 1976 um where british railways board looked at um uh you know provisional study for hydrogen as a fuel for railway traction so that's um uh slightly younger uh, uh than than i am so even back then we were thinking that it, it could be uh, a serious contender for for railways and it's only in the last um you know four five six years that we've really got got some momentum behind this and and um things are starting to happen um i, I don't want to re read all this but the key the key thing here this was back in 1976 was produced it the planting billion and was producing 50 tons a day and compressing the gas to 250 bar you know so that's you know, it's not, not quite 50 you know it's approaching 50 years ago this is what we were producing in in the uk and it'll be far higher than that uh, now and back back then so you know 45 years ago they were taught saying that this had been in operation for for 40 years so that you know it go, go, goes it's approaching 90 years of uh, large scale hydrogen production um, for for process gases. Um, things about hydrogen, when people are advocates for hydrogen, they'll say it's the most abundant element in the universe, which is true, and it's got fantastic energy density, which is true, um, and you can make it in lots of different ways, which is true, and I, as I mentioned, we can even make it if we've got a lactose problem. 
Uh, however, um, the big issue is um, the volume of hydrogen uh, as, as a gas, we have to squash it and we still can't squash it very much. So the volume of the tanks is, is an issue. Um, and on a rail vehicle, that's going to mean that you're going to use some of the volume inside the train. Um, uh, to, so, so there's less place for, for passengers. And, and I guess it's going to be an issue for aircraft uh, 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 as well. Um, you know, we, we can with hydrogen, we're competing with something that's really, really good, which is a, a liquid fuel uh, like kerosene or diesel or gasoline. And um, hydrogen just can't can't compete um, with that. So any vehicle that's produced with hydrogen won't won't be as good as what you can achieve with with those types of fuel. Um, making hydrogen economically is is a big challenge. And and also, you know, should it be used for transport? Should we be making green hydrogen and, and putting it into you know, ammonia production or something. Is that is that a better use for it? You know, these these are the sort of things that people will um, uh, mention when you're having discussion about hydrogen. Um, this is a map of G, you know GB electrification, and the coloured the coloured lines are the ones the routes that are electrified, and you can see all the grey lines, the more wiggly lines going into more rural parts of the country are the ones that that aren't electrified. So it's all all these routes that we 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 don't have a solution for at the moment, and that's the ones that we're um, we're looking at uh, closer to my home where I, where I grew up in in Pembrokeshire. It's a very nice place to go for your holiday if you're if you're interested. Um, that this sort of railway is you know it's a vital part of um, Pembrokeshire's plan to develop this railway, and this sort of railway um, won't be you know first in line for, for electrification, uh, but but uh, it is forming a vital part of the transport in that in that area. We we see this this kind of network as ideal for um, hydrogen uh, you know hydrogen trial um, be, 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 because because there's a lot of renewable. Uh, energy or there's, you know there's a lot of wind resource that you could uh, extract from uh, uh, wind turbines onshore wind turbines to produce the hydrogen in the first place um, and um, the, the the density of service is right in terms of making it economically viable um, so we, we at the university we did a lot of uh, work so the the thing on the left was a a, a, a fifth scale locomotive. We developed this as part of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers um, Railway Challenge. Uh, that was back in 2012. And, um, you know, people people commented on its appearance saying it looked a bit like a, a photocopier on wheels, but we, we deliberately, deliberately kept um, everything exposed. So we used uh, plexiglass to, to, to showcase the fuel cell. So people could come up and poke it and, you know, see the hydrogen tank and the fuel cell. And battery system that was running that that uh, little locomotive there, and then we we made it a bit more attractive, um, and that, that's a picture of me with with more hair uh, next to uh, one of the uh, Secretary of States for Transport, Chris Chris Graylin. Um, he he came to have a look at it, um, but a bit before we then went on to develop um, the the Hydroflex uh, train. So that 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 was in 2017 i think or 2018 that was um and we we then um launched a partnership with porterbrook who owned uh, rolling their own rolling stock and took one of their trains that had been um, been retired and was was been it was put in storage and we uh, then converted it to a hydrogen train so um uh, the the initial plan wasn't to ha carry passengers although we you know we can carry passengers but so we took out seats from the one of the central uh, cars uh, took all the seats out and installed the equipment uh, in there um, and we did we did this project in pretty much the, from start to finish was nine months but the actual engineering part was about six months uh, so we had to make do with a kind of off the shelf um, uh, components so you know it's, uh, Ideally, we'd wanted to have put some of this equipment underneath the train, but it was much easier to put it inside, inside the train, and that's what we did um, here. Um, and that allowed us, it was easier to do engineering wise, but crucially, um, lots of people came and I like, had a look at had a look at the system and were able to see the hydrogen storage tanks, the fuel cells and battery and so on. Um, and that's very, very powerful to sort of demystify uh, some, some of the technology. I think, you know, when, when you stand neck you know we had people standing next to um the hydrogen storage system for instance so they could see it see it up close see how good the engineering was and um be confident that it was uh, actually a viable uh, technology for for this kind of application um i made some pictures of it uh, going out onto the main line um we we, we took it out we, we, we did about 75 miles or so on the main line in some te uh, testing um the train worked uh, really well um 
we had limited power in the train so so we could only go we, we only managed to go 50 miles an hour which is still still pretty fast um uh, uh but since then porterbrook have developed the train further and um increased the power uh, put put some more fuel cells on battery in it and and now we we have a production uh, prototype that, that's ready to and, and it's been tested right now and ready to go into full service uh, some more pictures of it running uh, the, on, on the on the left there you can see the speed indicator just just shy of 50 uh, miles an hour uh, and, th and this was done instantly with a 100 kilowatt fuel cell so with a 100 kilowatt fuel cell um, uh, and we moved 140 ton uh, train at 50 miles an hour we did we have a battery pack that was about two it gave us about another 130 kilowatts so the whole train with 230 kilowatts um, moved at um, just shy of 50, 50 miles an hour. It just sort of reminds you how how good rail rail vehicles are. Because um, if you had 140 ton lorry, you'd need a lot more than uh, 230 kilowatts to get it going 50 miles an hour. Um, we're not the only ones doing this. So there's there's projects in Canada at the moment looking at converting a vehicle like this to hydrogen. Um, so we, you know, we're in collaboration with um, the university uh, in in Canada, uh, looking at this uh, kind of application. Um, and we also got application in, in the UK, looking at uh, switches as well. Um, other things that have gone on in in UK rail industry. So this vehicle was uh, it's a network rail measurement um, coach. It measures the track quality and track alignment. Uh, some time ago, that was converted to a, a hybrid. So it's an application of battery technology on the rail industry. Um, another another application of battery technology. This this train was converted um, and added a, a battery pack to allow it to run on electrified and non electrified um, routes. Uh, and then uh, this is another battery train uh, that's uh, that's in service. Um, yeah, I think there's, there's Great Western are running this between West Eden and, and um, Greenford uh, in the west of London. And um, these are the new Liverpool trains with with batteries on. So there's lots of examples of batteries going in to service in, in the UK now. Um, uh, so these trains have got batteries on. Some of them have got one train's got a significant battery on it, but all the all the smaller trains, all the all the other trains have got a small battery pack that allows it to um, move around the depot um, um, at slow speed without having the need for a con conductor rail. Um, Chil and Chilton Railways have developed uh, their own hybrid train, so this diesel train with a hybrid system to allow it to run into London without using its diesel engine to help improve air quality. Uh, and then, and then there's examples in heavy haul freight. This is a picture of a, a freight train, um, which is a, a Canadian Pacific. This is um, um, uh, has been developed, and it's a heavy haul freight train that's uh, been converted to a fuel cell uh, fuel cell system as well. Um, and then this probably the most this is probably the most famous um, hydrogen train. I think it's been in operation since 2016. It's the Alstom Caradia Island. Um, it's been running in Germany. Um, there's lots of orders for these trains, so that you know they're happening now um, and and going into passenger revenue service. So these things are. Uh, becoming off the shelf products uh, that people railways that want to decarbonize can buy this then and, and provided they can get a supply of hy hydrogen then um, they can run a, a decarbonized um, railway um, uh, straight out of the bag and um, we, we we did some work on this this is a, an american project um uh, stadler are uh, uh, have have got an order for trains uh, to run in in california near san bernardino um, so there's a short shortest railway there, and we we helped them uh, look at the different technology options, and hydrogen came out as a clear uh, winner in terms of delivering the service and and um, and, and providing decarbonisation uh, for for that route. Um, and that was a Stadler company. This is a picture of a, a Siemens train um, that's uh, again a, a hydrogen system. Uh, so pretty much ev everyone's offering them, uh, and then this is this is something that's been announced recently. It's a it's a locomotive here, uh, and the first vehicle behind the locomotive is basically the hydrogen hydrogen storage system plus uh, you know a fuel cell power generator that then feeds power into the into a conventional locomotive. Um, this is a partnership with Alstom and Vitel Water. Um, they want to move their water um, from wherever in France to, to, to some sort of depot to distribute it around, around the world. Um, so that's that's happening there. It's a picture of me with my colleague Clive Roberts, and this is with um, the Hydroflex train that Porterbrook have continued to develop. 
so this this train was developed uh, showcased at COP um, in Glasgow, um, and and it and as I said, it's got full capability, so it can run at 90 miles an hour, a range of something like 300 miles. But it also has its pantograph on it, so it can run on electrified lines, and uh, then when when the wires run out, it can switch over to running on on hydrogen. So just um, the reflections where we come from, we've come a long way. Um, there's lots of, you can buy these things um, and you can run them. So the technology is ready. Uh, I think there's still more work around like getting these initial projects um, into implementation and incentives to, to make that happen. Um, and, and, and equally thinking about infrastructure for rail applications. Um, we're basically using the, the work that the bus, bus industry have done and, and scaling that, um, which is probably good enough. Um, and, in, and I think importantly, hydrogen doesn't compete with electrification. So if electrification is the answer, then go, go for that. But where we're looking at hydrogen is, is on routes where you wouldn't consider electrification. So I think there's, it's important to make that, that point um, that we're, we're, we're not in a battle. We've got to work hand in hand and electrify the busy bits of the railway and do, you know, put hydrogen on the less busy bits to, um, and eventually meet in the middle somewhere and squeeze out diesel in, in the process. Um, so that's me. Thank you very much. I uh, hope I've sort of kept to time. Um, I'm looking forward to any questions. Well, thank you, Stuart. You kept to time. All of our speakers were fantastic today at keeping to time. And another really fascinating talk. I mean, particularly the history and the development of hydrogen trains. And we've come a long way. And uh, I was really interested with the cost intensity graph as well. That was, yeah, a particular highlight for me. So I'm going to go back through the questions. I'll start um, at the beginning of the question. So just give me a moment well because there's been quite a few we've got plenty of time for questions so um so we start off then a question from uh, chester davis um and this one will be for peter in comparison to mainstream methods of fueling aircraft how different are the storage techniques presumably a much larger and durable tank would be required to contain the hydrogen also, what sort of mileage are you expecting in comparison to these with more mainstream fueling methods, please? So I can answer part of that. Um, yes, the tank will need to be bigger. Um, traditional tanks for storing aviation fuel are in the wings. So you store the aviation fuel in the wings of the aircraft. But with liquid hydrogen, you can't really do that because it's stored at 20 Kelvin. Um, so just above absolute zero. So you have to have, have, to have very, very well insulated tanks. Um, they are actually fairly simple designs, but they're just very, very well insulated. Um, in terms of mileage, I saw that question, but I wasn't entirely sure what they're actually asking for there. So if, if the person is still on the call, can they give us a bit more detail about what you mean by mileage? Okay, thank, thanks for that, Peter. Um, so I guess the, the second question leads on to that. So is the mileage worth it compared to the energy that you would receive? So yeah, okay, we'll move well, on. I think, um, uh, you will always get less out than you put in. That's just thermodynamics. Um, but you don't make hydrogen because you want to make hydrogen for the fun of it. You do it because it's a useful fuel to do the useful application. Um, it's not just, it's, it's like um, Stuart was saying, you can electrify things or you can hydrogen things. It's, you do hydrogen for a specific reason. So it doesn't, efficiency doesn't matter as much. Thank you very much. Um, okay. Uh, Sorry, can I just um, chime in there? Uh, you said that efficiency doesn't matter um, that much, but if that was true, why wouldn't we just use standard um, aviation fuel? If the efficiency of burning like, like oil-based fuel is going to get yep. you further, then why would we convert that to hydrogen to first just to waste um, energy? Yep. The reason is CO2 emissions, climate change. Okay, thank you, Peter. So uh, moving on to our next uh, question, which is to Catherine, I think. Uh, yes, it is, sorry. Will the size of fuel cells affect the performance of the car? Hi, so yes, the size of the fuel cells affects the performance. So for the Mirai, obviously we've had that vehicle out there, I think it's 2015 that was launched. So we're going to be using the exact same fuel cell stack in the Hilux prototype conversion so we'll get the um, equivalent power from that fuel cell but within other applications fuel cells can um, can be added to therefore increase the power in in big, bigger vehicles so yes hopefully that answers the question okay thank you very much uh, the next one is a comment but ask 
wondering what your thoughts are, Catherine. So um, I'll read out the comment in full. So um, this is from Tom. I'm not convinced that the personal car will go far enough on these kinds of sales. My understanding is that the future of hydrogen is in large transports with large fuel tanks, such as buses, trains, and lorries. These transports have set destinations for refueling. You couldn't drive a hydrogen car outside your local area if uh, you have a, a fuel network. We already are falling behind on electric charging points without hydrogen pumps too. So what would your response be, Catherine? Yeah, so in terms of personal car use, so the Mirai is a personal car that has a range of uh, around 500 kilometres. So I think the expectation was that it had a small range. Actually, that's that's a large range. So personal cars can be used if, with fuel cells for um, longer range trips. But we see actually fuel cell application um, in larger vehicles because we want to do longer ranges in buses and in HGVs and larger vans and, and pickups. So we see that as, as the area where we want to pursue um, fuel cell vehicles within that lineup. Thank you very much. Thank you. And then uh, following on with another question for you, Catherine. Um, so why don't existing petrol sta stations simply add a hydrogen pump that provides a quick rollout and simple solution to the supply and distribution prob uh, problem for passenger cars? So actually there are some already existing. Um, so hydrogen refueling station within existing um, current fuel stations. So that does already exist. It would be the ideal solution Obviously, there's not enough at the round at the minute, but as a solution, it is possible to do that. Thank you. OK, another another uh, question here. So from Richard, uh, one of the key attractions of the closest uh, BVE competitor, the Ford F15 Lightning, seems to be a vehicle uh, to load capability and the opportunity to use a vehicle as a power source for equipment and for homes. Can an FCEV provide this sort of functionality and is it likely to be increasingly important in an energy system with more demand with uh, sorry with more need on for demand side uh, management and flexibility? Yes, so the answer is yes, an FCEV can provide an additional power source for homes or equipment. Yes, it's possible. It's something that's been studied in, in our mother plant in Japan. Um, and something that could be pursued in future. So definitely is possible. Thank you. And then this is your the last uh, question for you, Catherine, in this block of questions, unless some more have come um, through since. So um, this one's from Chester. In terms of security, how much has been done to protect both the fuel cell and the hydrogen storage from what could be a disastrous accident? Yeah, um, so a huge amount's been done in terms of vehicle safety. So. Uh, the hydrogen is stored in tanks uh, within the mirror and we're using those same tanks for the Hilux. They've been fully tested in all sorts of extreme conditions. So from a safety risk, there is none um, from the hydrogen tanks. Um, and the fuel cell, it, it provides no, no risk either. So yeah, very safe, been fully tested and proven to be, um, to be compliant with all regulations. Thank you, that's a very clear answer. OK, so if we move on to Stuart, then we've got some questions about railways and trains. So uh, first one from Janet. Aren't the German and Dutch and other railways already running on hydrogen trains for their main railway? I think you answered this. Um, so we have commercial hydrogen trains already available. Shouldn't we get on ordering the rolling stock to prevent more diesel um, uh, by mo modes being ordered and achieve decarb ASAP? Um. Yeah, I think the, 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 the answer is yes. I mean, we want to, um, uh, well, well, we're in a situation where we can do this now. Um, uh, the, the, the issue is getting the incentives cor correct because uh, still a diesel train is, um, you know, there's, there's, there's no kind of rule about not buying one. So um, we, the, everything's done privately, private finance. And if you can make an economic case to run, to buy a new diesel vehicle, then we, we, we can still do that. Um, you know, Trans Transport for Wales recently has, has ordered, um, you know, a new diesel fleet for the, pretty much the entire um, uh, Welsh Welsh um, rolling stock um, contingent, and that's 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 kind of one of the issues. Is rail vehicles are um, 
uh, last a long time. So they, they, they're around for a long time. And so the challenge that we've got in rail is, um, you know, if we buy a new diesel vehicle today, um, it still could be running perfectly happily in, in, in 40 years um, time. Um, you know, on, on my way to work this morning, um, uh, I cycle along the canal by by the railway at Birmingham, and I was passed by a a, um, a HST, which is you know you know nearly fifty years old now, and it's still running on the network. So, so the, the the issue is about how how we cost and how we compensate the industry in terms of like removing the existing diesel vehicles in a in a not too painful painful way. Um, so we, we we have we have that. I think that's the thing that we need to get get in place um, and the only way we can do that is by I think comparing with uh, you know if we, if, if we really want to decarbonize the cost the, the the obvious solution would be electrification but if that's far too expensive um, then um, hydrogen will be um, you know a much better um, a much better and, and cheaper alternative to full-scale um, electrification. I think I can see I could see another question if, if I may answer it now about how much hydrogen is used per kilometre, um, in and uh, uh, that that's a quite you know we've looked at this for rail vehicles and tip, typically um, you know you get a range of answers but it's somewhere between like 150 grams to 200 grams of hydrogen it would be used per vehicle kilometre so a, ve a, a train is made up of several vehicles or coaches so typically you might have a you know if, if you had a, a five five car vehicle then you're, you're looking at using um, probably a little bit less than a kilo per 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 mile to, to run that vehicle um, so that's how you can do your simple um, Back of the envelope calculations is is work out the price of hydrogen that you think we're going to be able to um, achieve, and then you know a, a kilo will get you a mile. Um, and it's it, quite easy to see that you can make that e economic given the amount of people that can be on a five car train could be, um, you know, two hundred people could be travelling on that. Uh, so it is it is uh, economically uh, effective uh, to to buy the fuel uh, at, at a decent decent enough price and, and run the trains. Sorry, have we, have we lost our host, by the way? I think we have. Should we go oh, down? No. I think we have lost Kat. Let me just... Yeah. Um, Should we carry on down the list of questions? Because we can see yeah, them. Yes, sure. Uh, Stuart, have you finished all yours? Um, yeah. Uh, I, 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 um, I may, maybe can pick up um, the, the the comment we had about efficiency. I think if I, I've got some uh, comments about that, I think that's a uh, a really important one um, because uh, you know in 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 my industry, in rail industry, people always say you know why why are you starting off with the electricity and um, then converting it to hydrogen, compressing it, storing it, transporting it. And then it, when it goes back onto the train, it inevitably will go through fuel cell and get back into electricity. So you, you actually throw away two thirds of the kilowatt hours in, in that process. And you know, people think that's, that's kind of nuts. You know, why would you not electrify um, uh, the, 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 the route? And it's, it's not, it is important to try and get as high efficiency as possible, but the 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 issue is an e an economic one um, because uh, we we want to be able to provide power for a train literally in the middle of nowhere, and the, the cost of putting up the wires there will be far higher than um, uh, providing you know developing a mobile fuel like hydrogen. So that you know that that that's why we we do it. So the efficiency is isn't important. Um, it's it's about producing a fuel that can be uh, put into a mobile vehicle and and provides a, a, autonomous capability. Um, you know, maybe maybe it's a bit like saying, can't we just tether all aircraft with a big cable and fly them like that directly? You know, you know, you can't. And it's the same argument for trains in remote parts of the world. We just can't. Um, uh, we we can't do electrification for for many places, and hydrogen is really the only candidate I think that we've got for them. Oh, Kat, we lost you for a bit. Thank you. Shall I go through the additional vehicle yeah. questions? I've seen that are more aimed at me, I think. So there's a question from Nagu about um, hydrogen combustion engines. So Toyota have uh, explored that that space. So we've got a Yaris and a Corolla hydrogen combustion vehicle. 
Um, so again, that's been tested to be to be safe. So that is something that we're, we're doing more in the sort of the motorsports area at the moment. Um, the next question was whether Toyota has got any plans to build a hydrogen refueling station. So no is the answer, but we are collaborating uh, with partners to to ensure that um, we can try and progress the, the refueling station network um, and also to supporting, you know, we're looking at supporting customers um, and fleet customers um, with the Hilux project. So we'll be we'll be supporting them as a one stop shop uh, with refueling to try and progress that that market. So not as a, a general um, Toyota led activity, but we're, we're supporting that that rollout. Um, another question from when was the fuel cell also used to charge the battery? Yes, yes, that's how it's done. Um, I've not read the next one. It's from David. Yeah, so I pick pick that one up about the um over overhead line situation. So, um yeah, uh, 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 uh you know overhead electrification is a more complicated railway than not having it there. Um and and it is more it is more vulnerable. Um you know we when we've got extreme weather, um high winds and so on. Uh, oh, 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 Often it's not the electrification itself that that, that, that causes a problem. And uh, David's right to say that you know fine objects often cause issues for railways. So quite often when it's really windy, what will happen is um, somebody's trampoline will will become airborne and land on a railway. So that that when when we've got really high winds, those are the sort of things that cause issues. Um, I don't know whether that's a railway problem or people not like tiny trampolines down, but you know it's it's the sort of thing we have to kind of deal deal with. Um, I think the thing about um, you know electrification systems is is sometimes when you do get problems, it can wipe out big bigger areas. So you you know you, you might um, it, and and it might take longer to recover from from a major disruption. So there are down, there are downsides um, to electrification. Um, it's not it, it it needs more intensive maintenance and you, you know a bit more looking after than a conventional um, railway. I think there's another question about would hydrogen be more suited to light light rail systems? So um, def definitely, yes. Um, you know, like, like, well, light rail systems and trams are currently looking at. Um, you know, the one the one in Bur that we've got in Birmingham, for example, has a battery on it, so the tram can run on overhead and then move to a battery solution um, to run through v v Victoria Square, which which we didn't want to put up um, overhead line. So. Uh, Extending that further, you know, we we could quite easily develop a, a tram system with a with a hydrogen uh, hydrogen um, fuel cell and battery. Um, that's def definitely achieve achievable. But as, as I understand it, I don't think there are many uh, examples of that. There's some small um, small tram systems that uh, and people movers that have got hydrogen systems in them. And they they work reasonably well. Oh, thank you. Thank you for everyone for continuing. My internet just dropped out and then I couldn't um, turn my mute off. Um, off. So uh, next one then um, from Jasmine. How will public uh, systems control the transportation of hydrogen in a safe manner? Are there concerns with mass transport of hydrogen in tankers going through tunnels? And is the distribution of fuel stations likely to be via a pipeline? I think this probably applies to everybody. So if we start with you, Stuart, and then go go around the panel. Um, yeah, I mean, this is this is an important thing. There's been a European project um, called High Tunnel that's got some good good outputs um, that's worth worth looking at. That they explored the issue of of um, moving hydrogen through uh, tunnels. I mean, the 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 issue is if a vehicle um, uh, becomes on fire you know what the hydrogen tanks will will vent and what happens to the vented hydrogen in the exclosed closed space um it's a bit outside my area of expertise i'm sure the other panelists can can comment you know, on it on it as well but it's something we need to we need to look at and understand is the use of hydrogen in more enclosed spaces um you know however that you know the, i think it is possible to solve the problems and nothing you know we we, we shouldn't sort of shy away from being able to come up with uh solutions to to, to this uh thank you uh catherine would you like to give a response um so mr stewart really it's probably outside of my area of ex expertise but um 
I, I believe a lot's been done in that area. I'm, I'm not I'm not an expert in that area to comment, honestly. OK, so if we move on to uh, a question that is directed towards you, Catherine, directly. So uh, okay. good news about filling stations. But when do you expect to see them operational um, in the oh. UK, especially in the Midlands and perhaps along the A38 uh, that runs by Toyota? No, that that's a million dollar question, really. I need a I need a glass <laughs> glass ball to look at. So, um, so we're seeing a decline at the moment. But just last week there was an announcement um, of of additional ones being rolled out to support more HGV use across the UK. So that was really positive. But we really need the government support on this to help build the infrastructure because um, it is too slow for what we need at the minute. Thank you. Um, this is quite a broad question. I think I'll start with you again, Catherine, because it's directed towards businesses. Um, do we have any direction for hydrogen businesses and safety? So we're, we're struggling on this one, actually, because the HSC doesn't have any clear guidelines on hydrogen safety. Um, so we're learning as much as we can as we go along, uh, sort of benchmarking other businesses and really trying to understand what do we need to do to make sure we're following safe practices um, for hydrogen. But there's definitely a gap generally within sort of uh, the rules and regulations around, um, around hydrogen in, um, in engineering and production areas. Um, do you have any other kind of comments on that one? Um, yeah, so when we developed the Hydroflex train, we, we used um, exist, the existing standard EC 79, I think it is, um, which um, gives guidance for, for hydrogen vehicles um, about where, you know, where to put the tanks and so on. Um, um, the, so the, and within the rail industry, there's uh, IEC um, um, uh, development of a standard standards for the hydrogen system on board the hydrogen storage system the fuel cell system and the refueling system so these things are going to hand in hand um with the development of the vehicles i mean i think um i don't know if this is the same but the experience of catherine is that the the pace of development in the vehicles is actually faster than the sort of standards and legislation you know we, we, we can build a thing quicker than we could write a standard for it and that and that is a that is a challenge really so we need to we need to think about the best way of um, you know man managing these things hand in hand because you don't want to end up with a system that that has uh, compromises um, and and conflicts where where one technology operator develops it in one way and then means it's not you know it's a bit like VHS Betamax sort of compatibility problems um, we don't want to have that um, in, in in terms of the refueling infrastructure and so on I mean the electric vehicles gone down this way you know there's t tons of different ways of c connecting cars to the grid um, it's it's quite you know when I when I speak to people who own electric cars um, that they've had to do a lot of work figuring out how what sort of charges they can use and they've got a wallet full of different cards uh, for different suppliers it's, it seems quite confusing hopefully with hydrogen we don't need to go down such a complicated um, uh, infrastructure side solution thank you for the uh, detailed response to that question so uh, another question for Catherine what sort of mileage are you seeing on the Hilux is it a viable fuel source for long journeys yeah definitely that's a key target of the project actually so we're looking at um upwards of 500 miles um, per fill. So that's a real key benefit of, um, of hydrogen and um, being able to have that longer range. So yeah, that's what we're aiming for. Thank you. And uh, a question from Robin for Stuart. Um, so, okay, where is the proposed location for the cylinders uh, to be fitted on the, H, uh, the hydrogen uh, rail unit? Also, will they be type uh, three, four, and fill pressure um, 35 to 70 um, bar? Yeah, okay, that's a, that's a good question. So in, in um, uh, well, if I, if I look at the European uh, trains, they, they're actually slightly bigger than what we can we can have in the in the UK. So if you, uh, they've got a larger what's called loading gauge, so their vehicles are allowed to be bigger, and those trains that run on mainline Europe, they they will have the tanks in uh, uh, above the passenger's head, so in the roof space of the vehicle. Um, in in the UK, we can't 
do that because the trains can't be as tall. Uh, so the you the, the the best solution would be in to to, to reserve part of a, a carriage for hydrogen tanks. So it's a bit like a, lo a locomotive end um, of an existing vehicle where the tanks will be be fitted. Um, so it won't be in a it won't be in a space that passengers can get into, um, but it will be in a space you know with the with the passengers could have been if the tanks weren't there, if you see what I mean. The the tanks that um, are, are used will be uh, ones with aluminium liner with carbon fiber wrap. I think that's type type three um, and um, three, 350 bar um, is, so 35 megapascals is the standard pressure that's that the railway's looking to use. Um, whether whether that's the right thing long-term, whether we should be looking at 700 bar is, is another question. But right now, I think most of the technology in, in railways has been adapted from the, the bus market. And, you know, we, we, we personally worked with Lux for, and they provided the tank solution and um, it was very much an off the shelf thing. They, they did it really quickly and it worked, um, worked beautifully. So the, the technologies are there for the, for the hydrogen storage. Um, in the future, it could go to higher pressure and different tank technology, I guess. Um, but at the moment, the 350 bar solution works. So uh, Stuart, one for you again, but this one is, I think, more of an opportunity. So there is a railway line ready for hydrogen powered passenger train that uh, would not conflict with an existing operator, which would be suitable for Hydroflex, which is the line between Litchfield and Burton on uh, Trent Derby. How quickly could you supply a free carriage Hydroflex for it? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think, that, um, you know, we, we, we want to do this. I think the, the issue and something through the university and through Hydex, we're trying to develop like a partnership to get all the people around the table and to go, let, let's let's do this now. We've got the Hydroflex train at Porterbrook developed. Um, so there's no reason why it can't go into operational service really, really quickly um, that won't conflict with an existing service, can be run as an overlay and and then we can we can get um, some real mileage um, under under our belt and show show showcase that it's work and hopefully that will be to open the door to other other rail systems um shortly after so the the answer is hopefully very soon um but the key thing is is actually events like this people groups like this getting the right people together to make the decisions um and and someone to press the button to go for it okay thank you very much so uh the next one is a bit of a pro provocation so we um, have got from uh, Tom, many participants here are energy transition PhD students. We understand climate change and the environmental impacts of hydrogen production and storage. Uh, saying climate change doesn't answer our questions and concerns. The climate uh, cost of producing blue and even green hydrogen is still a problem, even if the emissions from transport systems are technically clean. I think both end members are important here Otherwise, uh, this looks a lot like greenwashing in the public eye. Uh, you can't just ignore how hydrogen is produced, how, um, I hope this isn't rude, but we're just hoping to, uh, that some of our concerns are addressed. I'm happy to, to, to go. I, I, I mean, this is a really important point. You know, if you look at a global production of hydrogen, um, it is it's a significant contributor towards green, our current greenhouse ga gas emissions, um, but that's because you know the, the hydrogen is used in in um, industrial processes and a lot of the carbon dioxide is 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 released, um, or, or or used as another process gas in its own right. You know, um, people will remember when when gas prices went up a lot of our ammonia plants shut down so they're no longer producing hydrogen and then we also had a problem with carbon dioxide for for food use so you know it, it is is that carbon dioxide it has a useful um part of our economy as well because it's used to you know store our meat and you know kill our uh, chickens or, or or our animal you know it has it has a, a use um anyway so we, we we need to look at this i think um my thinking is uh you, you, we have to look at the the um eventual um production methods that will be commonplace which will be electrolyzers you know the um the, the hydroflex train is fueled from the electrolyzer in tisley and that's linked to um you know green energy production uh, so so in in theory that hydrogen is carbon free that's used in that that rail vehicle um you know wh whether you believe it or not uh, you know that the 
national grid is is tr truly green or you can buy green electrons or not but the, that, that's an, that's another issue but you can um in theory buy a wind turbine buy electrolyzer and produce hydrogen in a completely zero carbon way and i think that's what we've got to, got to push towards um it's not just developing the vehicles it's developing that quite clean hydrogen production pathway um which which is 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 achievable um is it it's achievable now uh, and i think crucially it's also scalable uh, so for many of these vehicles and systems that we're looking at uh, it would be possible to produce enough hydrogen to to run them all um if you look like uh, other things you know we, we're using in this country a lot of ethanol in our fuels now um is 10 percent uh you can't we you know if we wanted to go to 100 percent, we'd have to like stop eating and just produce wheat in in all of our agricultural fields you know you can't scale that much more than it is whereas hydrogen is something that is scalable um, um and we, we can produce enough renewable electricity to generate it at a scale that will satisfy all of these different transport sectors thank you for taking that one on um stuart thanks uh, so another question for you, Stuart, but I think we've just got time for two more questions. So this is our penultimate question. So Stuart, have you considered ammonia as a fuel for hydroflex as that as there is a safety concern? A separate tender could be used to have ammonia tanks and the fuel cell. Um, yeah, yeah, we've we've looked at this, this and um, so, you know, the, 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 you can use ammonia. Ammonia is a better um, fuel, if you like, in terms of volume and energy density than hydrogen alone. So it, it, it is better. It's not as, it's still not as good as other liquid fuels. So, it, you know, it is a, a contender. Um, you can actually combust ammonia as well uh, di directly or uh, in, in conjunction with uh, another fuel. So, you, so um, and, and it can also be cracked into hydrogen. So there's lots of options there. I think we're quite early in early days about um, look, looking at this. Um, uh, so it's definitely something to keep 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 an eye out for, um, but I think it it introduces another step in the energy process because you'd need to make um, the 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 whole system would be uh, get an electrolyzer, make some hydrogen, then use that hydrogen to make ammonia, then you know transport that ammonia around, then then you've got ammonia to be converted back into hydrogen. So you introduce another process step. And um, there may be some benefits from using ammonia in terms of it's, um, you know, it's a, it's a, you can liquefy it more easily and transport it easy, in, in a quite easy way. Um, uh, so we, we are looking at it. Um, it's not as developed as hydrogen, the, the, the rest of the hydrogen system though. So uh, it's one to keep an eye on, on the back burner, um, but uh, you know, it might, it might, it might do well, maybe, but may, equally it might not. Thank you very much, Stuart. So our final question is for Catherine. Uh, why do you think um, fuel cell EVs and um, hydrogen ICEs are slow to be adopted in the market? Is it a lack of hydrogen refueling points supply, lack of public awareness, uh, considering the uh, refueling process is the same for petrol? Um, the solution strikes me as the most consumer friendly. Really good question. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think every market has got different needs and developing at different rates. The infrastructure is definitely one of the key things that, you know, in this country is very slow, but in the likes of Germany, it's growing very quickly and that's helping support um, the rollout of a fuel cell electric vehicles. So I think, yeah, the infrastructure is a key one and also we need the product. So it's that chicken and egg situation again. Um, but yes, I like the, the fact that they think that's the most consumer friendly because that's the way uh, <laughs> we want people to think. So we do yeah. need to make people more aware that hydrogen is safe in fuel cell vehicles. So thank you very much. I think much. that's a great note to finish on. So I'd really like to thank our three presenters today, uh, Peter, Catherine and Stuart, who have given us such informative presentations and taking the time to prepare them and taking time out of their day to present to us. And also, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your questions. It's been a fascinating and stimulating kind of debate at the end and for the answers that our presenters um, gave us in the panel so thank you very much and i hope you have a good rest of the day and that you don't get snowed in in nottingham it's sort of drizzling a bit now so i think that's the end of today thank you very much thanks very much kat oh no thank you for joining us and thank you for carrying on the baton of the questions when i crashed no. out no problem.
Kat, I just need to make sure I've sent you uh, the latest presentation so um, before it goes out to everyone, so I'll pop that through. Yeah, if you pop that through to me and Anu, we'll make sure that the right one goes out. Brilliant. Thanks very much. Lovely. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank Cheers. you. Bye. 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 Bye.